This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. OK, we're now moving on to the second section of the syllabus, which is investment appraisal, uh, which will always account for a substantial number of the questions in the exam. Uh, and by investment appraisal, we're talking about investments in new machines or new projects. You know, maybe we're thinking of buying a new machine, which will cost us half a million. Um, uh, we've done estimates as to what returns we expect to get from the machine. Uh, and it's a question of deciding, is the machine worth buying? Should we accept the new machine or not? Should we reject it? Or possibly there may be a choice between two machines. Which of the two would be the better? Now, everything in this first chapter, which I've said methods, the basic calculations, is revision from paper F2. And so I shouldn't need to spend too long. Uh, I will quickly revise, but I shouldn't need to spend too long on it. Uh, there are three methods to be aware of, which I'll go through. But by far the most important one is discounted cash flow. And in this chapter, again, I just want to go through the basic arithmetic for arriving at discounted cash flow, which is exactly the same as in paper F2. I'll explain as we go through where the extra difficulty comes in F9, which isn't the basic mechanics at all. Now, because it's revision, I want to go through it fairly quickly. If you didn't do paper F2, or if you've forgotten paper F2, if anything I do in here, because I'm doing this chapter reasonably quickly, if there's anything that you're at all unsure about, then go to the paper F2 lectures uh, and watch there where I, I talk a lot more about why we're doing it than I'm going to here. Anyway, uh, let's make a start. As I say, by far the most important technique is discounted cash flow or net present values. Uh, and to hopefully remind you to revise what's involved, can you look at example one with me? It shouldn't take too long. A machine will cost 80,000. It has an expected life of four years with an anticipated and expected scrap value of 10,000. So at the end of four years, we expect to sell it for 10,000. Uh, the net operating cash inflows each year are as follows. 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, 10,000 in each of one year, two year, three year, four year. And what we mean by net operating cash inflows um, is the profits each year in cash terms. Because discounted cash flow looks at the expected cash flows I'll explain why afterwards. I just want to go through the mechanics first of all. But the net cash we expect to generate from our operations uh, in each of the four years is as follows. There's a cost of capital of 10%. I'll say a lot more about cost of capital later. That in itself is a whole section of the, uh, of the syllabus. But uh, basically it means that that's the cost of money, uh, that's effectively the interest we're paying, but 10%. Uh, we're asked to calculate the net present value and determine whether or not it should be accepted. Uh, well, the whole idea behind um, net present values, discounted cash flows, couldn't be more simple. We basically are looking to see over the entire life of the project, or the investment, do we expect there to be a net cash surplus or a net cash deficit? Here, let me write down the cash flows. It's going to cost 80,000. Well, the first flow we always say, well, is now time zero. So we'll have a cost of 80,000, a payment, a cash outflow, so negative time zero. And then we've got inflows, the net cash receipts each year of 20,000, 
30,000, 40,000, 10,000. And then an extra cash receipt in the fourth year, because at the end of the four years, we're going to scrap it. And the scrap value at the top of the question, 10,000. Well, those are the expected cash flows. Uh, and were it not for one pretty obvious problem in a minute, the decision would be obvious. Because over the entire life, is there a net cash surplus or a net cash deficit? We pay out 80, we get back a total of 50, 90, 110. So if you pay out 80 and get back 110, there's a net cash surplus of 30,000. And if there's a cash surplus, uh, we would accept the project. Had it been an overall cash deficit, if we paid out more than we received, then we would reject. Uh, the one uh, that, that basically is all that's involved in uh, net present value calculations, except, of course, that although there is a cash surplus of 30,000, it is taking a total of four years to generate and over that period there is an interest cost that that 80,000 either we're having to borrow money and we're paying interest or even if we've got 80,000 spare cash that cash could have been earning us interest by putting it in the project whichever way we look at it it's costing us the interest and so um, have there been, if there was no interest involved, there is a surplus of 30,000. Because of interest, the surplus will be lower. We need a way of taking the interest into account. And the way we do it is by discounting, by working out the equivalent amount now. And what I mean by that is, 80,000 now is obviously 80,000 now. Uh, we're going to get an inflow of uh, 20,000 in one year. Well, we simply say, um, with interest at the cost of capital here is 10% in the question, how much now would be equivalent to getting 20,000 in a year's time? Well, if it were X now, then with interest at 10%, in a year's time, uh, X would have grown to X plus 10% or X times 1.1. That's taking X and adding 1.1 or 10% of X. We want it to be equivalent to 20,000 in a year's time. And so we say the equivalent amount now, we divide by 1.1, X is 20,000 divided by 1.1, or standardly, we say we multiply by 1 over 1.1. And so the equivalent amount now, 20,000 divided by 1.1 1 .1 is 18,182. Uh, don't work in that sense in the exam. Always, for the moment, to the nearest dollar. And we're simply saying that 18,182 now in a year's time, if you add on interest at 10%, would have grown is equivalent to 20,000 in a year. Uh, we call that the present value. And uh, we say we multiply by 1 over 1.1. The figure we multiply by uh, is the discount factor. Uh, similarly, though, there's 30,000 in two years' time. Well, again, what's the equivalent amount now? If it was X now, with 10% a year, to um, after one year, if we add on interest for one year, it would be X times 1.1. X plus 0.1, 10% of X. But then uh, there's a, another 10% for a second year. So multiply by 1.1 again. 
1.1 naught squared. Well, we want that to have grown to 30,000. And so the equivalent amount now, x, 30,000 divided by 1.1 squared, or we always write it as multiplied by 1 over 1.1 squared, uh, which is 30,000 divided by 1.1 squared is 24,793. And so on. And in general terms, the discount factor, the figure we're multiplying by, is 1 over 1 plus r, where r is the rate of interest, 10% is 0.1, 15% uh, is 0.15, and so on, to the power n, where n is the number of years. So for one year, 10%, 1 over 1.1, the power 1, for 2 years 1 over 1.1 to the power 2, 3 years 1 over 1.1 to the power 3 and so on. However, although you must be able to discount that way, to save you messing around with 1 over 1.1, 1 over 1.1 squared and so on, you are given tables of the exam. And if you turn in the course notes, the lecture notes, it's one of the early pages, you'll find two sets of tables. One is headed up, present value table. I'll explain what the other table is after, but the present value table, it gives you the formula at the top, 1 plus r to the power minus n. Well, I think you should know from school, anything to the minus power is 1 over the figure to the positive power. It's another way of writing it. However, although you are given the formula, rather than, as I say, messing around 1 over 1.1, 1 over 1.1 squared, it isn't hard, but it takes time, you are given the discount factor for any rate of interest up, as you can see, to 20% at the top of the columns, for any number of years down the rows, up to 15. And so in the exam, however quick it may be on your calculator to do 1 over 1.1, 1, 1 over 1.1 1 .1 squared, in the exam, use the tables so instead of multiplying by 1 over 1.1, if you look at the tables, the interest rate is 10%, so the 10% column. For one year, the first row down is 0 0.909, which is 1 over 1.1. 1 .1. They've calculated it for you. And so the present value, 20,000, times 0 0.909, 18,180. Now it's slightly different, it's because the tables are rounded to three decimal places, but the examiner expects you to use tables 18,180. And similarly for two years, instead of having to mess around 1 over 1.1 1 .1 squared, it's the 10% column, the two-year row, we multiply by 0.826 and the present value again slightly different 24780 but that's simply the rounding in the tables and as you'll see later not only would you expect you to use the tables but also even in real life we're not worried about a few dollars that would be ridiculous and carrying on that way, we've 40,000 in three years. So the 10% column, the three-year row, 0 0.751 gives the present value of 30,040. 
and finally four years. Uh, the discount factor, 10% carbon four year row is 0.683. And I hope by all means do the two 10,000 separately if you want, or in do it 20,000 in total in four years' time. Uh, 20,000, 0.683. The present value is 13,660, if the two together. So there are the present values, the equivalent amount now. Effectively, by discounting, we've removed the interest. And therefore, the net surplus or deficit after accounting for interest. Uh, the inflows 18,180 plus 24,780 plus 30,040, 13,660, a total of 86,660, less the outflow of 80,000. There's a net cash surplus, in this case, of 6,660. I said at the beginning, had there been no interest, there'd be a surplus of 30,000. All we've done here is effectively remove the interest, the surplus, as you'd expect, is lower. Uh, we call that, for fairly obvious reasons, the net present value, or the NPV. And our decision, well, as I said at the beginning, if um, there is a surplus, if it's positive, as it is here, if it's positive, there is a, a net surplus after accounting for interest, therefore, we will accept the project. Had it been negative, had it been a deficit after accounting for interest, we would reject the project. It's as simple as that. Uh, make sure you can use the tables. I'll give you some practice in a second. Um, do note the tables only go from 1 to 20% in whole percents. And almost always in the exam, you're dealing with a whole interest rate. If you ever did get the situation where you needed to discount at all, 5.5%, well, 5.5% isn't in the tables, then you would have to use 1 over 1 plus R. So it was 5.5%, 1 over 1 plus R, 0 0.055 to the power n, the number of years. It's unlikely, but you could check you on it. So check you could do it from first principles, but assuming you are given a whole interest rate, 1%, 2% or whatever, uh, then again, you're expected really to use the tables. Now that's fine, and although we're not yet yeah, there yet, I said, <clears throat> this really is revision from F2. So if you are at all unsure, go back and watch the F2 lectures. Uh, but people get so excited and say ridiculous things about NPV and, oh, money's, money in two years is worth less than it is now because of inflation. Well, that's nothing at all to do with it. All we're doing, we're looking to see is there a net cash surplus or deficit the discounting is simply to account for the cost of money, the cost of capital, effectively the interest. Uh, that's not hard, as you'll see. Where the problem comes in F9 um, is not doing the actual discounting. This has to become automatic and isn't worth many marks. And you're not going to get many marks just for multiplying by four figures from the tables. Where the problem comes at F9 is getting these cash flows in the first place. You won't simply be told it's 20, 30, 40, 10. Uh, but that you have to be patient for. I'll deal with all that in the uh, later chapters. However, let's stay on the basics. Remembering that only 50% of the exam will involve calculations. Look at example two. It says in the previous example, what reservations might you have about our decision? We've decided to accept B 
because the net cash flow after accounting for interest is positive, the surplus. But what reservations would we have? Well, all sorts of reservations. First of all, the accuracy of the estimated cash flows. You know, the question told us it's going to cost 80,000, presumably I'm certain of that. But we haven't yet bought the machine. And we said the expected net cash inflows each year are 20, 30, 40, 10. Well, those are our only estimates. It's impossible to estimate precisely, you know, the actual uh, cash inflows may be higher, may be lower. And if they turn out, if we turn out to have overestimated and the cash flows are lower, then, of course, the MPP will be lower. It may even be negative. We'd have made the wrong decision. Now, the scrap value. We estimate we'll get 10,000 in four years. How on earth do we know how much we'll get in four years? You know, it's only an estimate. We might end up getting nothing in four years. Well, again, if any of those cash flows turn out to be different, the MPV will be different. If it's still negative, uh, positive, rather, then no problem. But if it ever ended up being negative, we'd have made the wrong decision. And we can go on and on there, you know, all of those cash flows potentially are estimates. Uh, the life of the project. We think it's a machine. We think it'll last four years. How do we know it'll last four years? It may last longer, it may last shorter. It was an estimate. Again, different life, different MPV, maybe a different decision. Uh, what else? Uh, the accuracy of the cost of capital. Now the question told us it was 10%, we used 10%, but there are two problems. First of all, uh, we've assumed it stays at 10% all four years. And of course, in real life, it might not. Interest rates change. It may go up, may go down. It would affect the net present value. Uh, in F9, we always assume it stays at 10%. And in fact, in theory, it will. I'll explain that later. I can't explain everything at once. But in, in, although we always assume it stays at 10% or whatever we're told, of course, in real life, that might not be the case. The other problem is even if we assume it stays constant, is how do we know it's 10%? You know, if, if it's simply a question of borrowing from the bank, you know what the interest rate is. But as you'll see uh, in the next section of the syllabus, companies borrow from different sources. They borrow money from shareholders. They borrow money from loans. And you will see in the next section of the syllabus that it's impossible in real life to calculate the cost of capital precisely. The best we could ever do is say it's about 10%. But you know, it may be 11%, it may be 12%. If it's different than 10%, the net present value would be different. Again, provided it was still positive, we're happy to go ahead. But if it ever turned out to be negative, we'd have made the wrong decision. What else? Something a lot of people don't realise, but it's a factor. We are assuming, and we always do assume, unless you're told different, that operating cash flows occur at the ends of years. Now, what I mean by that, we were getting 20,000 in the first year, 
And when I discounted, we effectively removed one year's interest. We divided by 1.1 to remove one year's interest. That was assuming that we pay out 80,000 now, you know, perhaps 1st of January, and that the 20,000 is received one year later, perhaps 31st December. I'm not worried about one day's interest, never. But we're getting it in one year's time, in two years' time, and so on. Now, of course, in real life, buy a machine today for 80,000. We may earn 20,000 the first year, but it'll be spread throughout the year. You know, if it was spread evenly, maybe you're receiving ooh, ooh, a bit under 2,000 a month or something. And so we should be discounting a bit of it for one month, a bit of it for two months. But we can do that, but you'll never be required to in paper F9. We effectively assume that we get the cash at the end of the year, end of two years, end of three years, and therefore remove one year's interest, two years interest, three years interest. We've assumed that the cash flows are at the ends of years, unless, as you'll see in some later chapters, on occasion, you may be told different, but otherwise we always make that assumption. Uh, what else? This may seem um, to some of you a silly point, but uh, it's something the examiner's always mentioned in his written answers to this sort of question. We've only considered financial factors. Uh, what about things like, oh, the effect on the environment? You know, I can remember one question, it's a long time ago now, a very long time ago, but one exam question, uh, where it was a company buying a machine, and one of the costs involved uh, was the fact we'd have to pay fines because it would be polluting uh, the river. And so we, you know, put in the costs and, oh, uh, we expect to earn this and we expect to have to pay this fine. And was the net present value positive or negative? But completely ignored the fact that if it's polluting the river, maybe we shouldn't be doing it at all, even if it ended up giving us a cash surplus. And finally, and then I think I've said enough, We're looking at cash flows not profits. You know, I said at the beginning, the net operating cash flows, it's like the profits, but in cash terms. And you know full well from earlier exams. A profit of ten thousand this year doesn't mean that you've necessarily a cash surplus of 10,000 each year. Uh, you know, I can't think of the profit you bring in all your sales, but perhaps only half the customers have paid us this year. The cash profit will be lower. Uh, in profits, we've char they'll charge depreciation, but depreciation doesn't involve paying out cash. The net cash flow will be different. And so we've not looked at the profits, we've looked at the net cash flows, and in theory that's better because it's cash that's needed to pay dividends. Look at what the law says, if you haven't got the cash you can't pay a dividend. And it's cash that's needed to grow the company, to buy more machines. Uh, again, I don't care how much profit I've made, it's cash that I need to be able to pay dividends, to be able to expand the company. And so in theory, it's cash flows that we should look at, net present value, in theory, is the best way of making decisions. But, don't forget shareholders. You see, the majority of shareholders, the first thing they look at 
when they get the financial statements is the profit. If profit's higher, they're happy. If profit's lower, they're not. And so as far as shareholders are concerned, they are likely to be more concerned with the profits and it's shareholders we need to keep happy. And yet we're not looking at the profit figures at all. It's the cash flows. Now that's something, again, I can say a lot more about later. I can't, you know, we can't do the whole syllabus uh, in one lecture. Uh, but it is a reservation. In theory, it's cash flows that matter. But if shareholders are more interested in profits, perhaps we should be looking at profits instead. Okay, well, as I said, uh, well, I don't want to get too boring because this should all be a revision. Uh, but uh, the basic mechanics of discounting, that has to become automatic. As I've said before, it's the cash flows that are going to be the problem. How we arrive at 20, 30, 40, 10, that's coming later. But once we've got the cash flows, discounting should take only a few seconds and it's never going to count for very many marks. All right, there's still a lot more in this chapter and still revision of paper F2. Just to introduce what I'm going to do in the next chapter, I said that one reservation about my decision here is that we've assumed the cost of capital is 10%, and yet you'll never be certain. You know, what if the cost of capital turns out to be 11%, 12%, 13%? I think you'd agree, I hope you'd agree, that the more expensive money is, the less worthwhile the project is going to be. If the cost of money turned out to be 12%, surely when we strip out the interest, the net present value is going to be lower. And so what's terribly important, or could be terribly important, is to know how much I could afford it to change by. You know, maybe if it's, I think it's 10%, maybe if it's 11%, oh, the net present value will be lower, but if it's still going to be positive, I'm still happy to go ahead. Maybe if it's 12%, it'll be lower still. If it's still positive, I'm still happy to go ahead. But if ever the cost of capital changed so as for the MPV to be negative, then of course we should re be rejecting. Uh, and for that reason, you can be asked to calculate something known as the internal rate of return. Uh, which actually I don't like the word because it's not really a rate of return at all. The definition, the only definition of the internal rate of return or the IRR, the only definition is it's the rate of interest Uh, for which the net present value equals zero. Now, I'll discuss the importance of it and how we would use it later, but you can be asked to calculate the internal rate of return, uh, and it's asking what rate of interest would end up giving an MPV of zero and this project we've had here, we think the cost of money is 10% and the MPV is positive. I said a minute ago, and I hope you do agree, that the higher the cost of money is, the less the surplus, the lower the net present value would be. 
And we want to know for the same project, for the same cash flows, what rate of interest will make the MPV zero? Will it be 11%? Will it be 12? Will it be 13? And so on. Well, as you'll see, the way we do it in the exam and in real life is effectively by guessing. And if you look at example three, part A says, for the same project, calculate the MPV. Let's guess. Calculate what the MPV will be if the cost of capital is 15%. Now I'm going to stop this lecture here because I really think you should have a go at it yourself. It shouldn't take you many seconds. If you understood how I uh, discounted at 10%, then there should be no problem discounting at 15 In the next lecture, I will do part A. I will discount at 15% and get the MPV. And then I'll explain how we go about getting the internal rate of return.